Well, thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Um, as the Dean said, I served in the State House, and um, one of my most important role models was President Clinton, so to be here in, in the Clinton uh, School is, is a great honor for me, and I really appreciate your coming out tonight. Um, I really am grateful for the opportunity to share my ideas about political dysfunction and how we can fix it. And I did begin my thinking, as the dean indicated, about this book, Two Presidents, as a state representative in Indiana. And when I first began running, like most candidates, I pledged to be bipartisan. I was going to reach across the aisle. I was going to judge ideas by whether they were good or bad, not whether they were Democrat or Republican. And I tried very hard to do this, and, and I did support ideas, whether they were good or bad, for the most part. But I also found it's very hard to remain above the partisan fray. You really get sucked in. And, it, and, and one of the things I learned was, you know, as much I could resist the pressures more easily from my constituents, from my donors, from my family, but the pressures from your caucus, those are the hardest to resist. And you, so you really get caught up. And um, so I realized that it's not, we, the high levels of partisan conflict we get, it's not because the voters somehow gravitate toward the highly partisan candidate and there's a selection bias going on here. Now, it's something about the system that's pushing people to be partisan. So I'm very Madisonian about this, right? James Madison, uh, when he worked on the Constitution, you know, he was very much about how do we structure the system. If we want people to behave in a desirable way, we have to give them the right incentives to do that. And so I thought, well, what, what is it about the incentives of our system that push people to be so partisan? And I came to the view as I thought about this that I write about in the book, and that partisan conflict at the national level, and even at the local level, is driven in large part by the fact that we give all of the executive power to a single person, rather than have the executive power shared among multiple office holders. Okay, so I want to persuade you of two points today. First, the seeds for political dysfunction were planted when the founding fathers chose a single president to head the executive branch. They had to choose and they had their debate. And the best way to address political dysfunction is to change to a two-person, two-party presidency in which the two presidents are true equals and they come from different parties. And as I'll explain, it's very important that they're true equals, you can't have any imbalance in their power, and they have to come from different parties. So before I get into those points, uh, what would a two-person bipartisan presidency look like? Well, we'd still go and vote in November, and we'd still cast one ballot, but instead of putting the top vote getter sending to the Oval Office, we'd send the top two vote getters, as long as they came from different parties. You couldn't game the system and run two Democrats or two Republicans. So we'd send these two presidents to the Oval Office, and they'd share the executive power as equal partners. So if a bill passed Congress, both of them would have to sign. Each of them would have a veto. They'd have to agree on executive orders, on nominees for the Supreme Court, uh, military decisions as commanders in chief. Um, they could each have a vice, well, they have to have a vice president for succession. They could have a small staff. But otherwise, they'd all have to agree. So there'd be one secretary of state that they would jointly agree on, one secretary of defense, one uh, director of the Environmental Protection Agency, and so on. Now, uh, on, in all likelihood, on a day-to-day -day basis, they would probably divide up responsibility for management. One might focus on energy, another on education. One might work more with European countries, another with Asian countries. But when a decision needed to be made, anything binding on the executive branch, they'd have to agree on. They'd have to come together and come up with a common, common plan. And with this, so we'd end up with joint decision making. It would be more representative decision making. Right now, we have a Democratic president who presses the platform of the Democratic Party. Other times, we have a Republican president championing the agenda of the Republican Party. Uh, with the bipartisan executive, there would be presidential partners advocating policies that reflect the preferences of the full range of voters. Okay, so that's what it would look like. Now, I've said that. My view is that we can trace political dysfunction to the executive branch. Now, why do I say that? Because isn't Congress the problem, right? 
Our senators and representatives can't bill, pass bills to reform immigration, reverse global warming, or stem gun, gun violence. Right? Even in the wake of the Newtown massacre, we couldn't get sensible gun regulation. Um, or last year, remember the, the sequester. Congress had set it up. They knew they, they would have to come up with some long-term budget plan to avoid those automatic across-the-board cuts. And they couldn't do it, and we got those across-the-board cuts. Okay, I'm not going to defend Congress. Congress is dysfunctional. But the problems with Congress, that's symptoms, it's not causes. And, and, and what's, what's really driving the dysfunction, as I said, the decision by the founding fathers to place a single executive above the executive branch. Now, why do I say that? What, 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 why is it a problem to have a single president? Well, modern presidents exercise an exceptional amount of power. We have what Arthur Schlesinger Jr. wrote a book in the 1970s called The Imperial Presidency. And he was right. Over time, and I'll talk about that, the, the executive branch has amassed far more power than the uh, framers expected. And because they wield this immense power on behalf of only one party, they fuel the high levels of partisan conflict that plague Washington. And because presidents exercise their power on behalf of only one perspective, it's their own perspective, they make too many decisions that are detrimental to the national interest. For good reason, we say two heads are better than one. Right, so let me talk about the imperial presidency, because as I say, that's really what I think is driving it, ultimately. So the founding fathers, of course, were very worried about government officials becoming too powerful. Right? Our revolution was all about escaping the tyranny of King George III. So they tried to build in all the checks and balances, right, to limit the power of this new national government. But they didn't protect against the imperial presidency because they didn't anticipate the central role of the executive branch would come to play. What the framers were worried about was Congress. They saw, they were worried that the le legislatures are the ones that expand and become too powerful. Uh, and so they, that's what they were worried about, co that Congress would aggressively push the boundaries of power. Now that may seem surprising, because remember, it was the tyranny of King George III that led to, led to the revolution. Why were they so worried about Congress? Why weren't they worried about the executive branch? And what happened was, between there was about a decade of experience after we got our uh, independence and we operated under the Articles of Confederation. For about a decade, between the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution, we, we had a system where we had very powerful state legislatures, very weak executives at the state level, and also at the national level, a very weak executive. And, and they found that that did not work very well. So based on that experience, they, they, they focused their concern on, on weakening the legislature. And so they divided Congress into a House and a Senate, right? Divide power, you weaken it. They gave the president a veto. And, and, and so they thought they drew the right balance. And it worked for, you know, 150 years or so. But what's happened over the past 75 years mostly starting with FDR and the New Deal, we've seen Congress transfer a lot of its power and a lot of its authority to the executive branch, and presidents have amplified the transfers with their own power grabs. So what's happened since the New Deal? Congress has created all these agencies in the executive branch, Environmental Protection Agency, Health and Human Services, Housing and Urban Development, Federal Trade Commission, and, and down the line, the alphabet soup of Washington bureaucracy. And so we've got this huge administrative state that has responsibility for writing all the regulations that govern our lives. Um, and presidents oversee all of this regulation writing. And, and they've gained all of this policy making power that the framers never anticipated. Presidents control the issuance of regulations for air quality, energy exploration education, health care, consumer protection, and many other concerns. And they do so under vague legislative instructions like, and I'm not really exaggerating here, do what is required to protect the public health. Congress passes these, right, Congress says we want a cleaner environment. And then they tell, and the president then figures out how do we clean up the environment. Presidents have other policy making tools. They can, you know, they, this is very controversial under George W. Bush, the signing statements that they write when they sign a bill to to influence how the bill would be interpreted. They issue executive orders. 
they grant waivers from statutory obligations. So just uh, some examples from President Obama. When he, by, the time, by 2025, the fuel efficiency of our motor vehicles will have doubled from when he took office. Uh, and all of that was done by the executive branch, no congressional involvement. President Obama expanded offshore drilling for oil and gas. He's granted waivers from the No Child Left Behind statute, so the states really are no longer bound by a lot of the important provisions. Stem cell funding is another good example. Under President Bush, we had very restricted federal funding for stem cell research. President Obama came in and opened it up much more broadly. Um, so presidents have all of these tools um, to influence domestic policy without congressional involvement. Uh, and even their, their power, their authority on the foreign policy side is even greater. Presidents play a far larger role and Congress a far smaller role in foreign policy than the framers intended. Uh, and a great example to illustrate this is the war-making power. It was very clear from the Constitution that Congress decides when we go to war, the president is the commander-in-chief. But starting with Truman, president after president, not every president, but Truman took us into Korea without a declaration of war. President Clinton, I hate to make, to, to attack, I'm not attacking him, he uses power and often for good, but his decisions to use our military in Kosovo and Sudan and, and other places were without congressional authorization. President Obama just sent our military to Libya without congressional authorization. Presidents reach agreements with other countries without congressional participation. What does the Constitution talk about? It talks about the Congress negotiating, the Senate ratifying, but, but the President reaches all kinds of agreements without congressional participation. Presidents unilaterally recognize other governments and terminate treaties. Back uh, when we switched our recognition for you know, the legitimate government of China, we used to recognize Taiwan. We switched to mainland China. That was Jimmy Carter without congressional involvement. We used to not be able to go to Cuba. Who decided that we couldn't travel to Cuba? It was the Eisenhower administration, not Congress. Um, presidents revise our immigration policy when Congress wouldn't pass the DREAM Act, remember, to create a path to citizenship for people, young, uh, you know, people who were brought over by their parents as kids and they grew up here. Um, Congress couldn't, get, couldn't pass that, another failure of Congress. President Obama decided to create his own Dream Act unilaterally. He said, we're not going to deport these young Americans. We're going to grant them work visas. Uh, so we've got this vast expansion of presidential policy making, and we've lost the Constitution's design for co-equal branches of government. We now have, a, instead of a equal branches or instead of a dominant legislature, we have a politically dominant executive branch. And, and I, know pres you know, I know it's frustrating for President Obama and, and, and it was frustrating for other presidents. I mean, you do have to work with Congress for a lot of things, for Social Security reform and health care reform. But there's, as President Obama has said, he's going to use the tools at his disposal to do things unilaterally. And he's, gonna, he's doing it on the environment, and, and he's doing it on a lot of other issues. Now, many scholars, so what do we do about this? So many scholars will say Congress needs to assert itself. Because after all, a lot of this is Congress transferring its handing over its power to the president. So a lot of scholars say Congress just needs to, you know, live up to its responsibilities, its checking and balancing roles. The problem is Congress has proved incapable of doing that and there are various collective action problems for why they never will be able to do it. I can go into that later. Um, other scholars say, no, this isn't a problem. Yes, it's true, presidents have the upper hand and have all this power, but that's good. Because Congress is dysfunctional. Congress could never get its act to act efficiently and effectively enough to respond to the demands of the modern American state. We need a very strong executive. Now, I happen to think we don't need such a strong executive, but it doesn't matter. I don't need, we don't need to settle this question because even if the executive branch should have all of the power it does have, it's too much power for one person. No one person should have this much power. And it, and it leads to two problems, the partisan conflict problem and then the bad decision making. So let me start with the partisan conflict problem. When one person exercises this enormous power of the modern US presidency, we shouldn't be surprised that the system breaks down. A single president represents the views of just one political party. But all of us, 
Everybody wants and deserves to have a voice in their government. Right now, only, well, Obama, 51, 52 percent of the public feels like they have a voice in the Oval Office. And so it's no wonder that the party out of power spends almost all of its time trying to regain the Oval Office and less of its time trying to address the country's needs. So under the current system, what do we see? Democrats and Republicans spend not millions or hundreds of millions, now billions of dollars to over the, you know, every presidential election. And then what happens? The election's over and the next the cycle begins. The very next day, each party launches its effort to win the next presidential race. The party the president lines up behind the president's initiatives to ensure a successful administration. And the losing party tries to block the president's proposals so it can persuade voters to change parties at the next election. We get the permanent campaign, right? So, so here are some examples. In the summer of 2009, the Obama administration is pushing the Affordable Care Act. Jim DeMint, former senator from South Carolina, says to his colleagues, we need to vote against affordable care. We need to break the Obama administration. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, November 2010. What's the most important thing he can do as Senate Minority Leader? Reform the tax code, balance the budget, more jobs? No. Make Barack Obama a one-term president. And it's both sides. When George W. Bush, his second term in office, he was going to make Social Security reform his, his you know, domestic priority. He was going to make sure Social Security was going to be on sound fiscal footing for the future. So he put forth his privatization proposal for Social Security. It may not have been the best idea, and Democrats in Congress had good reasons to oppose it. But they didn't, so they thought, how should we respond? And they decided, we're not going to put forth our view, our idea about how we should reform Social Security. This may sound familiar, Republicans on health care. This was Democrats on Social Security. We're not going to put forth an alternate proposal. We are going to make opposition our highest priority. We are going to weaken George W. Bush, and they did. But as Ron Brownstein says, they took Social Security reform off the table. So that's the current system. It's all about, you know, if you like this, we, you like say yes, we say no. If, on the other hand, each party knew it would elect a partner in a coalition presidency every four years, then you don't have anything to gain from this kind of political, these partisan tactics, this partisan obstruction. Instead, each party would be freer to judge legislative proposals on their merits and when proposals that came out of the White House would be judged on their merits, both sides would have an incentive to support them because they would be bipartisan proposals. Or to put it another way, strong partisan conflict can be expected under a winner-take-all system for a presidency whose power has grown to the level of an imperial presidency. Indeed, if you look, this, you know, we've had, if you go back, compare what Congress was like in the 40s and 50s to today, partisan conflict has gone up like that. And, at the same time that the power of the presence, he's gone up at the same time. Um, and you know, right now, a, a candidate can win election with a small majority or even a minority of the public vote. And as a result, you've got substantial numbers of voters who feel that their interests and concerns are not represented in a public, politically dominant White House. In a two-person White House, nearly all voters would have their preferred candidate serving and would feel much more comfortable with initiatives that emerge from the executive branch. Instead of half the public feeling disempowered and disaffected and wanting to break the president's administration, almost all voters would have a stake in the success of the executive branch. And here's the important point. There no longer would be this mass of disaffected voters. Mitt Romney's 47%. Right now, as I said, they feel like they have no voice in the White House. And it's no wonder they're receptive to the Tea Party, because the Tea Party is is for them the only game in town. Here's somebody standing up trying to give them back something. And, 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 that's, and that's the nature of radical movements. They only are successful when there's a large mass of disempowered people who, who aren't that extreme, but, but, but that's the only place to turn. Um, so going to a bipartisan executive takes, takes away these incentives for, for obstruction. Moreover, there would be positive incentives to cooperate. And these are some lessons I learned when I was a legislature. One thing, uh, 
Remember when we had the Economic Recovery Act and the Health Care Reform Act, the Obama uh, initiatives, Republicans almost across the line opposed them. And part of that was the calculation, let's say they liked it, they really thought these are good ideas, and they voted for them. They would not get any political credit because these were democratic initiatives and the public would see them as democratic ideas and give the Democratic Party all the credit. So why, if you're looking for some political bang out of your vote, better to vote against it. You defeat it or it fails and then you can get some credit. And a bipartisan executive, both sides could get credit, credit for presidential achievements. The other thing I found when I was a state representative was I could help my constituents by trying to get bills passed, but I could often do more by helping them break through the red tape in the executive branch because you know, the chair, the, the commissioner for the Department of Transportation or the Department of Environmental Management would, li would pick up my phone calls a lot quicker than my constituents. Now, that worked when I had a Democratic governor. It did not work when I had a Republican governor. So right now, if you're a Republican in Congress, cultivating warm relationships with the executive branch is not going to get you very far. But in a bipartisan executive, both sides benefit from having good relationships with the executive branch. So you remove the, the, the incentives for obstruction, you create greater incentives for cooperation. Now I don't mean to say that the executive, the imperial presidency is the only cause of partisan conflict. There are other causes. We've had partisan conflict. You go back to the 1890s and uh, there was high partisan conflict when we didn't have an imperial presidency. So there are other causes. But even so, a bipartisan executive is important because whatever, if, if there are other reasons to be, by, be, to be partisan, we need a counterbalance. We need to give uh, members of Congress incentives to act in a bipartisan fashion. And a bipartisan executive would provide an ex effective counterbalance to partisan conflict from any cause. Okay, so that's the partisan conflict side. There's a second reason that's related to the imperial presidency, but it's independent from partisan conflict. A second important reason, and that is having a one-person imperial presidency invites decision-making harmful to the country. And, and here's where the framers, you know, it didn't work out in, in an important way. Because what was the framers' vision? The framers' vision is Congress is our deliberative body where people from different perspectives come together, north, south, urban, rural, uh, industrial, agricultural, people with different perspectives come together and, and come up with policies that, you know, are compromise policies and that sort of reflect everybody's concerns. And then the president executes. It's the executive branch. The president is supposed to implement policies that Congress makes. But because of the imperial presidency, and as I said, all this rulemaking that goes on in the executive branch, presidents have now become major makers of policy. They're not just executors of policy, they're creators of policy. And that allows pr national policy to be made in the absence of a robust debate, debate among multiple decision makers who bring different perspectives to the table. So I think the framers are right. If you're just having somebody execute policy, you want a single decisive person who can act with dispatch. But when you're making policy, you want multiple person pop bodies, people with different perspectives, the Congress, the Supreme Court. As Woodrow Wilson said, the whole purpose of democracy is that we may hold counsel with one another so as not to depend upon the understanding of one man. And when it comes to making policy, there is much truth to the maxim that two heads are better than one. Studies by economists, psychologists, and other researchers, you know, they look at what's the best way to make decisions? One person, small groups, large groups, well, you know from Congress that large groups is not the answer. No, small groups work best. And, and I'll pick on George W. Bush here. Um, his waging war on Iraq. Single decision makers can make very poor choices. When you have two people from different parties with different perspectives, they'll bring different problem skills and approaches and you get better decision making that way. Two presidents would make more good choices and fewer bad choices than single presidents. And I've looked at the historical record. Thomas Jefferson, would we ever had the Louisiana Purchase without Thomas Jefferson? And yes, we would have because 
the, the man he defeated uh, in 1800, uh, the election before the Louisiana Purchase, John Adams, so presumably Adams would have shared the White House. While Adams' Federalist colleagues did oppose the Louisiana Purchase, John Adams publicly endorsed it and called on his colleagues say, no, this is a good idea and we should do it. So we get more of the good thing, de decisions like the Louisiana Purchases and we'd avoid a lot of the bad decisions like the Iraq War and the Bay of Pigs. Now, of course, single presidents don't make decisions in isolation. I've kind of characterized this in an extreme way, single president all alone and, uh, and uh, groups. But so presidents, yes, they do consult with members of their cabinet and staff, so you do get a lot of the benefits of group decision making. Nevertheless, there's a big and very important difference between deciding alone after consulting with advisors who are inclined to reinforce your inclinations and sharing decision making with a partner who is inclined to challenge your inclinations. So the example I like to use is the Supreme Court. Right now, a nine member Supreme Court with very different perspectives and they work out their differences and come up with decisions. Imagine if we had a single justice. Could be John Roberts, could be Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but one justice with eight very experienced law clerks. You'd still have a nine member group, but you would get very different decisions than you do now. Well, I've talked about two presidents, how they could make, uh, provide more effective leadership and when there's time for deliberation and careful study, but even in times of crisis, I think we'd be better off with two. Because two-person decision-making can accommodate the need for rapid decision-making. Presidents always confer with trusted advisors before making even the most urgent decisions. And it's important, bless you, in times of extreme emergencies to have checks and balances because right now we don't and sometimes we end up with very unfortunate decisions like the internment of the Japanese Americans in World War II, the excesses after 9-11 uh, with the torture and, and other excesses. Um, so two people can make re decisions but sufficiently rapi with rapidity, but they can provide effective checks. And, and we have international examples of group decision making in the times of national crises. Israel is a good example. They regularly face national security challenges. And what do they do? They conf first they convene their security cabinet, then their full cabinet. They operate, they respond on the basis of group decision making and they respond with sufficient uh, alacrity. And, and some deliberation is good, even in the face of unanticipated international events. The example I'd like to use, back in the summer of 2008, when Obama and McCain were in the midst of their, uh, their campaigns, remember Georgia and Russia got into their little war. McCain immediately denounces Russia for its aggression. Obama says, well, wait, let's make sure we have more information. And it turned out that Georgia was also at fault. Had McCain been our president and just denounced Russia, that would have been un very unfortunate. Well, would, uh, why wouldn't two presidents bicker too much, right? You, Mitt Romney, Barack Obama, they didn't seem to agree too much on the campaign trail. Why wouldn't they just spend their presidency paralyzed by their inability to share? And, and that's what the frame was worried about. They were worried about dissension and rivalry if you had multiple executives, and that's why they went with the single executive. But it's more likely that two presidents would develop a meaningful willingness to cooperate with each other. And, and for two reasons. First of all, they wouldn't have the incentives to develop a relationship of conflict. Elected officials are highly partisan, no doubt, but they're partisan for a purpose. It's not for its own sake. It's because in typical power sharing arrangements, one person can hope to establish a dominant position by outmaneuvering the other person. Right? If I don't cooperate, I block you. Right? If Republicans block Obama, they think they'll get the White House back. But in this coalition presidency that I talk about, there would be no way to gain the upper hand. It's a 50-50 relationship and, you know, wait, well, I'll get more votes in the next election. No, no matter what you do, you're in a 50-50 relationship. So you can't gain more power by sabotaging the other side. On the other hand, not, so you don't have an incentive for conflict, but you would have a very important incentive to work cooperatively. Having reached the pinnacle of political life, presidents care most about their legacies. Right? They, how are the historians going to treat me? Am I going to be up in the pantheon of Mount Rushmore? And, and I like to use George W. Bush's uh, decision to evade Iraq in 2003, because I think this is very helpful. Uh, there were a number of reasons for why, why he thought this was a good idea. But one of the key reasons 
was that he was influenced by the potential for introducing democratic government in the Middle East, right? We depose this tyrant Hussein, we replace it with a democratic government. This will serve as a model for the rest of the Middle East, which will become a region of democracy, and that will be George W. Bush's legacy, which would be a very, would have been a great legacy to transform the Middle East. And remember, during the campaign, he was not going to do nation building. So even something he promised us he wasn't going to do, his legacy interest overcame that. And Obama and healthcare is another good example. Jonathan Alter in his book, The Promise, when he talks about the first year of the Obama administration, should they do health care? And his advisors, Rahm Emanuel, David Axelrod, no, don't do health care. The public wants you to get jobs. Focus on the economy. And they were right. But Obama, according to Alter, ultimately felt for greatness, he needed health care. That was going to be his legacy, and it may very well be. Well, if two members of the coalition presidency spend their terms locking horns, they wouldn't be able to implement the key initiatives that could enhance their reputations and burnish their legacies. The, so they got two choices. I work together, leave a legacy. I fight and leave no legacy. And, and the, op, the option of no legacy would just be so unattractive. Well, has shared governance ever worked? Sure, coalition governments are common in Europe. Germany, Austria, and Belgium commonly have coalition governments. And sometimes, importantly, because a lot of the coalitions are majority coalitions, but often they have grand coalitions. Austria, uh, for most of the half, half of the time since World War II, has had grand coalitions. But my favorite example is Switzerland. Um, not because they're chocolate, but because uh, they've institutionalized broad power. And, and, and what they do, they, they start with a parliamentary system, right? proportional representation. And then, like other parliamentary systems, their legislature selects the executive branch. And it's a seven-member cabinet. And, and what's different, it's not from, they depart from a parliamentary system because the seven-member executive, they serve fixed terms. They can't be brought down uh, before the end of their terms. And, they, so, and, and what's important about two things, these seven members, they represent the five major parties, which gets about 80% of the vote. So they re represent the, you know, across the board, um, both sides of the political spectrum. And they share, it's equal decision-making authority. They operate by consensus. They don't take four to three votes, five to two votes. They operate by consensus and they share power. And, and it's worked. They've been able to avoid the kind of political conflict that we experience. And they once experienced. It's not because they're a homogeneous country. In fact, on measures of social heterogeneity, and I'm not sure how people figure this out, but they figure it out. And, and they are more socially diverse than we are because they've got French, German, Italian, people who went to in war with each other twice, world wars. Um, they've got Catholic and Protestant. They had a civil war too in the 19th century, not as bloody as ours. It was Catholic at first as Protestant. And the lesson they learned from theirs, if you want to bridge social divide, you have to make sure everybody has a voice in their government. And that's what they do. They make sure everybody has a voice. Well, finally, I want to, uh, I've talked about my intuitions, about international experience. I'll also talk about game theory. So game theorists, what do they look at? They think, what, what relationships lead to cooperation and which relationships break down is, uh, in the game theory lingo, defection. And so they look at, you know, what, what are the conditions? And, and the coalition presidency will incorporate the key elements of cooperative relationships. So when individuals have an ongoing relationship, they're much more likely to cooperate than when you have a one-shot relationship. The example I like to use, think about the person who sells you a car, right? They're not likely to see you again, so they want to squeeze whatever they can out of you. But the person who services your car, I go to Pat's Marathon, Pat's very nice to me. He wants me to come back every few months for my oil changes and tire rotations. We have a very nice relationship. So having a long-term ongoing relationship uh, frequent interactions, regular communications also lead to cooperative relationships. But the most important thing from a game theory standpoint, as I've said, is the fact that the two presidents would have been a symmetrical relationship with the amount of power they exercise. And as I've indicated, the, their willingness to work together depends in large part on the fact that each of them would possess exactly half of the executive power, and no maneuvering could change that. So, Again, they wouldn't have the incentives for 
obstruction. They have powerful incentives for cooperation. And so these two presidential partners would cooperate. Not, they, they wouldn't do it out of virtue. They wouldn't do it because it's the right thing for the country. They do it out of self-interest. It's because that's how they leave their legacy. And that people with strong philosoph... Would Eric Cantor and Nancy Pelosi, could they really work together? And, and the, one of the reasons why I'm confident is I've worked with people like this. And so much of what they say is, is posturing. It's, it's, me, it's more means to their ends of gaining power than, than you know, true ideological commitments that they could never break. But it's not hard to find examples of elected officials who exhibit flexibility in order to achieve their political goals. Think of Mitt Romney. And, and Mitt Romney is a great example for a couple reasons. One is, remember, as governor of Massachusetts, champions individual mandate to purchase health care. That's his health care reform. As a presidential candidate, he denounces it. And it's also instructive because, it, remember, could Democrats and Republicans really agree? Well, individual mandate to purchase health care was a Republican idea that Democrats passed. There's much more common ground. Immigration reform. It's not that we lack a blueprint where people can agree. It's because the political incentives for the Republicans right now, they don't, they're not sure whether they're better off opposing or, or supporting. Um, my own Senator Evan Bayh, uh, when he was contemplating a run for the presidency in 2008. His voting record suddenly became very liberal. And then when he abandoned his presidential run and, said, and started turning to, you know, re-election uh, re as a uh, senator from Indiana, now he had to appeal to the general Indiana electorate rather than the Democratic primary electorate, his voting record plummeted, became the most conservative of any Democrat in the U.S. Senate, more conservative than Ben Nelson of Nebraska. And my favorite example of flexibility of and people you would think would be at each other's throats is from the game theory literature in World War I. Remember, they had a lot of trench warfare in World War I. So the Allies on one side, the Germans on the other. Now, if you're in that trench and you're, and you're at, you know, what do you do? You, if you go try to attack the other trench and you get out of your trench and you start running and attacking, you get, you get mowed down like a sitting duck. And the, and the guys in the, in the trenches recognize this. So they worked out these informal agreements with each other. They pretend to fight. So, you know, their the generals would think they were fighting, but they didn't really fight because it was in their self-interest. These are people who were at war with each other, real war, not just political war. Well, in some shared power would address political dysfunction by diffusing partisan conflict and promoting better decision making. A two-person presidency may seem radical, but dysfunction in Washington has gotten to the point that radical reform is needed. The alternative to a two-person presidency is even greater partisan conflict and even more bad presidential decisions. Well, I thank you for coming out, and I hope we have some time for questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Edward. Questions? Anybody got a question? Yes, sir. Uh, would you um, comment on this statement? It seems to me that more people would come out and vote. Uh, we get lazy or we get tired of saying, well, tomorrow morning we're going to wake up and there's going to be a Republican or Democrat. And there's a lot of good third party people that are running. And it sounds like they would, we might get them in quicker. Yeah, no, this, that's a very important point. One of the realities, when you have, as we have, winner-take-all elections for all of our, virtually all of our offices, when you have a system of winner-take-all elections, you, you only get two parties. You can't get a successful third party. Because what happened in 2000 if you were a Ralph Nader supporter? Your big concern was, if I vote for Nader, all I'm going to do is doom Gore and, and make sure that Bush wins. And that may well have happened in Florida. So third party candidates, vote, their supporters are too worried about supporting them and, and you know, dooming their second choice and getting their, their, their last choice. So they peel off, and that's what happened to John Anderson in 1980. Polls showed he had pretty good support, but he ended up with only 7% of the vote. When the top two vote getters, if you're a Ralph Nader or John Anderson supporter, then you can say, well, I'll vote my, my, pre my true preference, and if my true preference comes up short, then he, I know that either my first or second choice will run second. So it does open it up for third parties in, in an important way. The other thing, uh, I, don't, I thought you were going to go to it, but 
how will that change the voting, right? If we don't have a strong third party candidate, will anybody show up in November? Um, it probably will drive more, it, it may have fewer people in November, but it drives people to the primary voting. Because right now, people don't show up for primaries. I was shocked. I was in Iowa for a year. Uh, I thought everybody goes to the Iowa caucus, right? It's, it's this hugely important election or, or, or you know, uh, caucus. And sure, I mean, I would be there. Um, the high watermark, 18% in 2008, when you had very con highly contested nominations on both sides. Uh, people don't vote. A lot of people say, I'll wait till November. I'll have my say in November. Uh, but if, you, if you're, all you're going to have is you know, no third party candidate, then you've got to have your say in the primaries. And that will drive a lot of the moderate voters who don't affiliate with parties, it will drive them into the primary voting pool. And I think that would be very good. So we have a question back here. I think incorporating the uh, system that you're talking about requires an enormous amount of change. And I often wonder if it would give the Supreme Court so much more work in deciding on the separation of powers and executive orders that might conflict with each other with two executives. Would you comment on that? Oh, well, they, would, they could not uh, issue their own executive orders, right? They'd have to agree on a common executive order. So we, the, the, we wouldn't, the, there wouldn't be any issue about the Supreme Court having to referee disputes. If they, would have, if they couldn't agree on something, then there would be no uh, executive order or no legislation signed. Um, but, but one of the reasons why I feel strongly about this is, you know, a lot of the problems that, have, that I talk about with the imperial presidency, if the Supreme Court would police the, the separation of powers, we wouldn't be where we are, but the Supreme Court has shown no interest in, in trying to contain presidential assertions of power. That, you know, they rarely will step in, um, very occasionally. And, and so, yeah, but, but no, because the presidents would have to agree, we wouldn't have any need for a referee. Wait a minute, wait for the microphone, please. about um, the primaries and encouraging people to come out to the primaries. What are your feelings on allowing Democratic or Republican national conventions to actually endorse more than one nomination? Oh, yeah, no, it would be very important. Yeah, you, it wouldn't be good if, if any party could have more than one candidate, right? Because what's, this will only work is if, if you have the two presidents really come from different sides of the spectrum. I mean, you know, if you get a third party, they're going to be on one side more than the other. You really, if you have two Democrats or two Republicans, then you end up with the problem we have today of, you know, a substantial chunk of voters not feeling like they're represented. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I wasn't speaking in terms of then electing two Democrats or two Republicans, but having more having four people on the ballot in November to still encourage November voting instead of, and then the top Democratic and the top oh, Republican. Okay, so you could, you could put forth more than one, but you'd still only require, you'd still require, um, yeah, I, I suppose that you just, the one, yeah, that might work. The, the one thing I would worry about is making sure that Democrats couldn't influence any, you know, who, one of the, any of the Republican nominees. As long as they're true Republican nominees and true Democratic nominees, yeah, that probably would be fine. Ben. Thank you. Um, ben Croner, first year student here at the Clinton School. Um, the reason I came tonight was because I was very intrigued by uh, the title of your presentation. Um, and I find myself uh, swayed by your argument. Um, do you see what you're proposing as anything more than a thought experiment? No, that's a good question. I, I, realistically, I don't see this happening in the next few years. So two things I, that I think is important uh, to talk about. One is um, so much of the focus is on Congress as the source of the problem. So I think I want people to, to, to recognize that it's not Congress so much. It's the presidency is really a problem. I think this is the right way to solve it. But 
other people, by, the more we think about the, the problem of the executive branch, the more will other ideas, and, and if, if it's not my idea, maybe another idea, but it'll get, this will, the way we get to, um, or maybe the way I put it in the book is, if we think about what might be the optimal solution, even if it's not realistic, at least us gets us thinking in the right direction. And if we can't get to the optimal solution, at least we can get closer to it than we are now. The other thing is, um, it's who knows, you know, how, I know how people think today and, and the likelihood of something like this passing in the next five years, but in 20, 25 years, you know, what, what is happening now, nobody thought would happen 20 or 25 years ago. So, so I think we, you know, you know, my job as a professor is, is to say what we should do. And the alternative, I, I, you know, I wouldn't want to get up and say something I don't think may, would work. I, you know, I think it's better to talk about what, what makes the most sense and what's optimal. And if we can't get there, um, at least we make sure we think about what we should be doing. A couple of things. First of all, thank you for your thoughts, but I'm trying to imagine a Nixon-McGovern co-presidency and whether Nixon would <coughs> excuse me, ever um, develop the dynamics uh, that you were outlining earlier. But that leads me to another question. If, if the top two candidates become the co-presidents, if candidate A gets twice the votes yeah. of candidate B, why would he want to share equal power and how consistent with democratic theory might that be? No, to, that, that's a very good question. On Nixon, that's an interesting one because I forget who came up with this. Richard Nixon, uh, the last great liberal president, right? Because you, know, you think now a lot of this was driven by the Congress he had, but you you look at EPA and, and all the OSHA and, and all of this, you know, great liberal legislation that came out of his, his administration. In other ways too, it turns out he was ve much. Um, better on uh, civil rights than one might assume. He was, in many ways, he was reasonably progressive. Um, but the other question, yeah, no, this is, uh, there are two important assumptions about what I propose. One is the, the, the presence will be driven by legacy, and that the desire to leave a legacy will, will get them to work with their partner. The other thing it rests on is the stability of the Democratic Republican balance. Um, and I, you know, we've had a stable two-party system since about 1840. So I looked at all the elections since 1840. And it's never really got, we've never gotten to 75, 25, we've never gotten to two-thirds, one-third. The high watermark is 61 percent. So LBJ, FDR, and I think Reagan were the three who each got to the 61 percent mark. But most presidents win, you know, a little over 50, a little under 50, and and we do have a pretty stable, and as I said, that gets back to the fact that when you have winner take all elections, it's very hard to get a third party. So you're right, this would break down. And in the countries where shared governance has broken down, it's because they tried to, you know, like in Cyprus, they had a 50 50 between the Greeks and Turks when the population was four to one. Or in Uruguay, they had a two to one in balance and then as the minority party gained more than a third of the strength they didn't adjust. So yes, it wouldn't work if, but if one party, but uh, I th things have been stable for so long that I think it's probably likely it would remain stable. There may be some more questions and I hope uh, you will come uh, visit with David when he signs copies of two presidents or better than one. I want to thank the group from the University of Arkansas at Monticello that's here today. And David, thank you very much for being here. Good luck at your Bowen Symposium tomorrow. And um, you just got a Ben Croner endorsement of a, of a, that's a pretty strong Democrat that's now moved to the bipartisan thing. So thank you all for being here and uh, come by his book. Thank you.